Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Rogers. I am a executive director and institutional consulting director for Greystone, which is a business of Morgan Stanley. And I'm thrilled to be a part of your continuing education program for MICPA. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the case for alternative investments and the mechanics of private investing. And let me start by saying that I'm not necessarily recommending any investments, nor am I recommending the asset class, because for those of you that are watching this program, I don't even know what your investment policy is. So my mission today is to simply educate you, and then you can decide if there is a value in using this asset class for your own portfolios or perhaps for client portfolios. And by the end, I think you're going to walk away with a better understanding of the different strategies that are still broadly labeled as an alternative investment, and then we can go from there. So let's think about why you might include alternative investments into a diversified portfolio. You know, obvious choice, diversification. But in this particular asset class, it happens to significantly reduce the correlation to that of traditional asset classes. So a traditional asset class, of course, is your typical stock and bond portfolio. And then when you carve out an allocation to alternative investments, you're attempting to potentially enhance returns. Um, but at the same time, your mission might be to reduce volatility. Now I'm speaking to you on April 28th and we're in a very interesting period of this markets. So reducing volatility is top of mind for most investors. And this might be one way to add value in that regard to an overall diversified portfolio. So let's take a look at the table of contents uh, for today's conversation uh, and just give you an idea of what we're going to touch on. So as far as alternative investments overview, I think there are some common misconceptions about what alternative investments are. And then we're going to drill into the various types of alternative investments like hedge funds, uh, private investments, which would encompass you know, private equity, uh, private real estate, and private credit. Uh, credit, of course, being fixed income or debt. Uh, we'll also touch on our process on due diligence. And due diligence is paramount in this asset class because there are quite a few opportunity sets available in the alternative investment space, but you have to make sure you know who you're hiring to manage your money. And then we'll touch on how to incorporate it within a thoughtful portfolio. And again, this isn't to suggest that you should invest a certain percentage of your money or your client's money in this asset class, but how do we do it and what's the thinking behind that? And that's really what I'm focusing on in that regard. So let's get to it. Uh, alternative investments overview and common misconceptions. You know, when you look at what involves, what's involved in a uh, alternative investment, you know, I think that many investors think about alternative investments as just hedge funds. But hedge funds are just one investment strategy within the broad labeling of the alternative investment asset class. And you can see on this particular slide where alternative investments do include hedge funds, of course, but also real estate, private equity, real estate investment trusts generally on the private side, um, private credit, venture capital, which is the early stages of private equity. Uh, and then there are three stages, which we'll touch on uh, within the private equity investment strategy uh, that uh, cover that type of investment. But the takeaway here is to make sure you understand that there are more than just hedge funds in the uh, alternative investment asset class. And on that point, just to build on that thinking, when you look at a risk reward chart, and that's what this particular slide illustrates, when you look at the risk reward chart of how different investments have historically performed not only from a return perspective, but also from a volatility perspective. You can see on that bottom axis where it says annualized standard deviation, uh, you're looking at the volatility from the average. Uh, and some of that can be positive and some can be very negative. So you have to make sure you understand what you're getting into when you get into this asset class. And then many people are excited about the return history in this asset class. And frankly, when you look at this 20 year time horizon, there have been some very compelling returns uh, in the alternative investment space. And not only that, but the mission here is to make sure that we maintain that relationship between risk and reward. And so you can identify where the standard deviation plots on a particular strategy and what the historical return has been 
uh, for that investment. So we like to look at uh, five different uh, investment buckets or strategies within the alternative investment category. And just so you understand GIC, GIC is Global Investment Committee. That's our acronym for Morgan Stanley's Global Investment Committee, which is the team of investment strategists that help us assemble asset allocation recommendations for our institutional and our high net worth clients. And so they help us uh, organize the different strategies based on the type of outcome that we're searching for. So within the private investments uh, section, you, you'd be thinking about private real estate investment trust, which by the way, are substantially different than a publicly traded real estate investment trust that you would see listed on the stock market on a daily basis. Uh, they're also known as limited partnerships in some cases. So they're different structures within real estate. You could look at absolute return assets uh, and the mission there is to attempt to earn a positive return regardless of the direction of the market. And I think there are many investment managers that are always searching for ways to compare their return to that of the market. And that's known as relative. So if we're, if we're down 20%, but your portfolio is down 15%, we've added value because we didn't go down as much as the market or relative to the market. The difference here is that regardless of the direction of the market, good or bad, these types of strategies are designed to earn a positive return regardless if the market goes up or lower. Now that doesn't mean they do every year, but that's what they're striving for. And then lastly, equity hedge assets. You're looking at investing in equities, uh, but the mission is to hedge out some of the downside exposure. And that's the term equity hedge. So in this case, these are a little more relative and can be useful, especially in a declining stock market. Let's talk about liquidity at the outset. And so in this particular case, you can see where we have three different levels of liquidity. We have daily, we have monthly or quarterly, and then we have multi-year. And above that line, you can see where a commodity or gold or master limited partnerships or real estate investment trusts that trade on the stock exchange, they have daily liquidity. And so you aren't searching for investments that give you what is known as a uh, liquidity premium. And that means that you would demand as an investor a higher rate of return in exchange for agreeing that your money is going to be illiquid for a longer period of time. The second part, the middle part, where we have those absolute return assets or equity hedge or equity return assets, primarily hedge funds, they generally have monthly or quarterly liquidity. And when you're doing a liquidity analysis for your organization, you would probably label that as gated liquidity. And all that means is that they are liquid, but they don't have daily liquidity. So there's a certain gate, there's a limit as to when I can access my capital if I wanted to redeem my money. And then multi-year, those are in your private equity, your private credit, your private real estate. In exchange for a higher return potential, you're willing to lock up your money for a longer period of time. And, and we'll talk about that uh, in greater detail when we examine that asset class. So let's drill into hedge funds. Hedge funds are often thought of as one investment strategy, uh, but the underlying investment strategies vary widely. And so what these four columns illustrate uh, are the common characteristics of a hedge fund and how they might contrast to one another. So you're looking at the pursuit of absolute returns instead of relative returns as we discussed already. They attempt to capitalize on a wide variety of market conditions, meaning that they can actually provide a positive return even if the markets are going down. And that's one of the very important elements of that structure. They're generally structured as a limited partnership, uh, which means as we looked at that at the prior slide, there is a form of gated liquidity uh, in that asset class. Generally doesn't mean it's long-term, um, but as a sidebar note, there are many hedge funds that are willing to reduce their fees if you're willing to commit to a longer time horizon. So perhaps a hedge fund might have a normal quarterly uh, liquidity opportunity set for the investors, 
But if you decide that you're willing to tie up your money for one or two years, the, in exchange for that certainty of your capital, the hedge fund might reduce the fee by you know, half of 1% each year. Something that's meaningful that at, over time will add considerable value to the bottom line. And then lastly, uh, they tend to be managed by very highly specialized investment professionals. Hedge funds generally attract the top talent. Uh, and the reason for that is because they pay the best. And so if you're a very, very good investor and you can manage other people's money uh, capably, you might gravitate toward a hedge fund structure because you can make substantially more money uh, in this structure than you can in a typical liquid mutual fund or separately managed account uh, that you would find in the traditional markets. So there are three broad categories of hedge funds and you can see the three differences by the dark blue, the light blue, and then the gray shaded uh, columns. So let's run through the six columns. Uh, on the far left, we look at absolute return. These are macro funds that attempt to provide a, a consistent return regardless of the direction of the market. And then the second two columns, the, the lighter blue, uh, are called equity hedge. And so these are generally known as relative value or equity market neutral. And so what their strategies do is they provide more of an uncorrelated exposure to the traditional risk asset markets. So again, maybe they may lose money, but they generally don't lose as much. So it's relative. And then equity return, those are the three gray shaded columns. Uh, and and the generally you're looking at event driven funds, distressed credit, and then equity long short. And the whole idea here is that they're attempting to earn superior returns, but with less dispersion and a lower level of volatility than you might experience as an investor in the traditional markets. So let's examine the correlation and the historical performance of a variety of different strategies within the hedge fund construct. And so really what I want to focus on on this page are correlation. And you can see in the third column, we've labeled that as correlation to the S&P 500. So how similar is it to the return profile of that in the traditional stock market? And then we look at the 25 year sharp ratio. The sharp ratio is the measure of the return per unit of risk taken. And really, if you want to drill into the essence of investing, you always focus on the sharp ratio. Because again, we're trying to identify for a given level of risk that I'm accepting for my capital, what type of return am I earning uh, for that risk? And then lastly, maximum drawdown, because that gives us an opportunity to identify whether or not this structure has added value, especially in a declining market. So if we look at correlation to the S&P, how similar is the return profile of this strategy to that of the stock market? And you can see, just use global macro as an example where uh, it's 0.31. So it, takes, it has roughly a third of the similarity to the return profile of the general stock market. Go to sharp ratio. I mean, there are some very, very compelling sharp ratios. This is a situation where the higher the number, the better. And so if you look at a sharp ratio of 1.4 for relative value, that's enormous. That's an enormous pickup in return per the level of risk I'm willing to tolerate for my capital. And so we're always looking at how efficient an investment strategy is on that risk reward exchange. And then as a basis for comparison, you can see that the, the sharp ratio for the S&P 500 is 0.51. So that gives you an idea just how compelling some of these strategies have been historically uh, compared to that of the stock market. And then the final column on the far right gives you an idea of what the maximum drawdown has been. And you can see here again, look at the S&P 500, down 51% as the worst period and compare that to an investment strategy that has had its worst drawdown of 9% with equity market neutral. Now I wouldn't isolate on any one of those columns 
as a reason to invest in that strategy. But when you take into consideration the total added value of a strategy in regards to its correlation, in regards to its sharp ratio, and if your mission is to reduce some of the downside capture of the performance of your overall portfolio, you then can work backward and say, well, this is what I'm trying to do for my portfolio. This is what I'm trying to add to the portfolio performance set. And maybe this particular alternative strategy will allow me to, to meet that objective. And so that's the way that I would use these numbers. Bottom line with hedge funds is that they clearly have outperformed in bear markets, meaning when the markets are going down and underperformed in rising markets known as bull markets. So frankly, we haven't really used uh, hedge funds. Uh, this is my 35th year in the business and we haven't really used hedge funds in a meaningful way. We started introducing them to our institutional clients uh, in a meaningful way in the fourth quarter um, of last year um, because we started worrying about valuations. So I guess if you think about when would you want to include a hedge fund strategy in the portfolio, it's when your sense is that market valuations are high or peaking, depending on how you define it, and you want to put a little bit of a buffer in the portfolio. I don't view it as market timing. It's just changing some of the investment vehicles in a portfolio because you're more concerned about the risk profile and the downside capture ratio of a portfolio versus thinking that the economy and other reasons for investing in the stock market when you're expecting a rising market uh, is going to be positive. And so that'll help you decide whether or not you want to add strategies or reduce some of the strategies in the hedge fund landscape. So now let's talk about private investments. And when we think about private investments, that of course includes private equity. That's a label that many of you probably are familiar with. It includes private credit, which is fixed income or lending. And then it also includes real estate. So there are three different private structures with completely different asset classes under the same label. And so we're gonna drill into the why for each one of them and identify where there may be some value to an overall portfolio structure. So there's three phases in a typical private investment process. Uh, the first phase is basically raising cash. So if you're a private equity manager and you've identified a strategy that you want to pursue with other people's money, the first step is to get that money and raise the capital. And then you go out and buy the companies. So once you have the cash, now we go out and look for, and I'm just gonna use private equity as the example here because it'd be confusing if I keep using the three different strategies. So I'll just stay with equity for a minute. So you go out and, and you're gonna buy companies and you're trying to identify companies that you believe are well-priced, that need some help, that with your vision and strategic improvements can create value. That takes us to the second phase where the general partner in this case attempts to add value through these strategic improvements and maybe cost reductions, different strategies as a manager that you might use for a company where you're trying to improve the results of the company. And then the third phase is the idea of selling the company to harvest a gain. And sometimes you're taking that company to an initial public offering if it's large enough. Other times it might just simply be selling it to a new buyer in the private market. But the whole idea is we start with cash, we buy companies, we create value by adding value to that company's management team, and then we sell the company and harvest our gain. And it sounds simple, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a great level of skill. And it also takes a lot of time. Very rarely, occasionally it'll happen, but very rarely are you doing quick trades in the private markets. Usually you're looking at these structures to be longer term because it takes a little bit of time to get through that three-step process. So generally I would suggest that if you enter into a private equity investment, you should mentally be prepared for a 10 year hold. And we'll get into why some of that adds a lot of value if you have a longer term time horizon. So this three step process that we just reviewed 
uh, results in what's known as a J-curve. And the J-curve is just the common language that we use in the private equity environment, which is something you have to tolerate as an investor because in the early years when they're raising cash and they're searching for companies to buy, think about it as the expenses are greater than the returns. And so you can see the J on that lime green line on the chart here. You can see in the beginning, the first few years, the cash outflows are greater than the inflows. And then as investments mature, and then you get to the point of the harvesting phase, you start to flip that and suddenly your inflows exceed the outflows. And so that's why early on, it appears that these investments may not be all that terrific. And if you're a short term investor, stay away from private equity. You definitely have to have a long term time horizon uh, mentally to commit to the strategy. Historically, as we saw on a chart on the risk reward exchange, private equity has done very well but it also requires you to have a long-term time horizon where you're willing to tie up your capital for a longer period of time so that you can last long enough to create the value and then ultimately harvest the gain. And that's where your rewards will occur. But as I said, in the beginning, it looks like we're losing money. Are we sure this is a good idea? And I'm gonna tell you that that happens virtually all the time in a new fund. It looks terrible in the beginning and then suddenly uh, it starts to accelerate and look very positive. So let's talk about the competitive advantages of a non-private investment, or excuse me, a, a private investment over a non-private investment. And you can see these three bubbles uh, that try to identify different advantages in the private markets. Uh, so first of all, there are many more private than public companies available. So the opportunity set is much greater. We have a lot more to choose from. The, uh, the possible control in the bottom gray there, where we might have management control or a board seat, um, that's compelling. And you think about it from the perspective of the involvement you might have as an investor. If you were to invest your capital in General Motors, a publicly traded company, it's unlikely that you as an investor are gonna have very much influence into the management decisions with that company. You'd have to be an enormous investor to have that. So if you're just Mark Rogers, that is a general retail investor that has X number of shares of General Motors, I'm basically gonna be uh, willing to allow the current management team at General Motors to influence the performance of the company. And that's what I'm signing up for in the public markets. I'm not interested in that in the private. I'm hiring people to get deep in the weeds with the management team of each of the companies that are in our portfolio. And then that takes us to the light blue, the information advantage. We have tremendous information before we invest in the company. And so there's a fellow by the last name of Schwartzman from Blackstone. He calls private equity legal insider trading. And I can uh, agree with that because before you invest in a private equity company, you literally have the ability to go inside the company, sit with the owners, and a lot of these situations are family owned businesses, where you can look at the books with them, you can identify what they're doing, you can see whether or not before you make the investment, if you think your management skill set can add value to the performance of the company after you invest your capital. Then after that type of due diligence, you can decide whether or not you want to invest capital in that particular company and take an ownership percentage uh, in, the, in the business. So that's where I believe there's a considerable advantage for private investments over non-private. On the other hand, the negative is the liquidity issue because when you're involved in the private investment scheme, you have to be willing to be invested for a very long period of time where you don't have liquidity. So going back to my General Motors investment concept, if I decide that I need money for, to pay for my son's wedding on Friday, if I need to sell a thousand shares of GM to do that, I can do that. Uh, if I have money invested in a private equity structure, I won't have that opportunity because I've decided when I made the investment that that money was going to be illiquid and not available to me until I started receiving distributions when they harvest the gains on the companies in the portfolio. But this illiquidity premium can be a huge value because you're, you're forced to be a long-term investor. And you have to remember in the stock market, 
time is really your only ally. There are some very, very negative things that investors do with behavioral economics because they allow their emotions to interfere with the performance of their portfolio. And when you can take away that opportunity to sell, you just have to deal with the inherent volatility of the market. And since you're looking at an investment that's probably going to last 10, 12 years, it really doesn't matter what the stock market's doing today. It, you can't do anything about it anyway, so that's a good thing. But also when you really step away from it, from any investment, whether it's in the public or the private markets, does one day matter or one month matter over a 10, 12 year time horizon? Very rarely does it matter. And so you're forced into having this long-term time horizon and it protects you from yourself sometimes where behavioral economics, this common thinking where when the markets go down and many investors get scared and sell. And then when the markets are at their all time high, you get this fear of missing out and more investors are apt to buy. So it's just the opposite of what you should be doing, but that's just the way we're wired as investors. So generally, and you can see on the schedule, when you look at the left axis, the compounded annual return, and then on the bottom axis, the time horizon that we're holding our investment. When you see that you're in the private equity venture capital space for five to 10 years, historically you've earned a much higher return in exchange for that illiquidity. That's known as the illiquidity premium. So let's talk about the structure uh, on how some of these programs are, are made for investors because this is one of the reasons why many very skilled investment managers want to be in the alternative investment space. It's profitable. And so there are generally two types of fees that are charged to the shareholders of these portfolios. One is called a management fee. And, and your management fee is the annual expense to, to run the business. And in our general industry language, it's known as two and 20. It's not always that case, but two and 20 is very common where you're paying a 2% annual management fee. And that management fee is designed to you know, pay the investment managers to run the business, to pay the utility bills, to pay the, uh, you know, the different parts of just simply running a business. Uh, it's not necessarily the most profitable component of the structure but it's there to provide a level set of income on an annual basis so that the business can survive. On the other hand, there's a performance fee that's also known as carry. And carry is generally the extra return that the general partner will earn after they've guaranteed a rate of return to their shareholders or to their investors. And so in this case, in that language of two and 20, the carried performance fee is usually around 20%. And it's very common for that 20% sharing arrangement on the performance returns to be shared after the shareholders earn a minimum rate of return. It's not uncommon for that minimum rate of return to be 6%. So if I'm an investor and I, in, within the construct of the portfolio, I'm paying my management team 2% a year to run the business, after I get a guaranteed return of 6%, then future profits are shared 80% to me and 20% to the general partner. That's where they make their money. And they make a lot of money doing it. And I frankly want them to make a lot of money because that means I'm making money too. And so they've given me a little bit of protection by saying, hey, you're gonna no, make no less than 6% before we get our share. But then once you get that guaranteed return, we're gonna take 20% of the profits and you're gonna get 80%. And so those are you know, the, basically the structures. Now there are gonna be different structures where it might be one in 20 or one and a half in 20. Uh, sometimes, as I said earlier, that management fee can be reduced from 2% to 1% if you're willing to commit to a hedge fund for a longer period of time. Uh, so that's generally where you see a little bit of uh, variable. On the other hand, the carried uh, interest is usually set at 20, um, and, and, but the, the preferred return can adjust. Sometimes it's five, six, 8%, depending on what the structure is. Uh, but that's why uh, you have such an interest from skilled investment managers to go into the private uh, alternative investment structure. 
So let's talk about the three main types of private investments. And on this slide, you can see on the left, we have private equity, which is the ownership of companies. The middle column focuses on private credit, and that's lending or fixed income. And then far right is private real estate, which is a different asset class that generally uses both equity as well as fixed income uh, or lending uh, in that particular space. So we'll take a look at each one of these individually as we move forward. Starting with private equity, this particular chart illustrates the returns from 1990 through 2018. So a very longer period of time that includes two very important periods in our stock market. The dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s and then the Great Recession in 2008. So we like to use that time horizon because it's instructive to see how these investments performed, not only in the good periods of the market, but also in the challenging periods. And so you can see on the far left, US private equity uh, has historically provided a 15% annualized rate of return. And you can compare that to the lighter blue S&P 500, which has historically earned 10.1% over the same period of time. But to me, that's not the most important number on this particular chart. If you look under the bar for each one of them, US private, you see a squared area that says 12.9%. That's the level of standard deviation, the volatility measure. And if you compare that to the S&P 500 at 15.4%, now you've get that risk reward exchange that we were talking about earlier, because historically, if I can make 15% with less volatility than an investment that has historically provided me 10% with more volatility, that's exactly why you might want to consider private equity as part of an overall diversified portfolio. And then you can compare the next bar, which is global to that of the MSCI All Country World Index. That's what the, that far right light blue bar illustrates. And very compelling numbers there, especially on the return. You're, you're doubling the return with a lower level of volatility outside the United States than what was available on the public markets for that same period of time outside the US. So very compelling numbers, not only from a return perspective, but more importantly, in my judgment, from a volatility perspective. This is a busy slide and I'll, I'll, I'll simplify it by looking at the means of private equity access on the far right. So there are three primary strategies. You've got primary funds, which are a blind pool that they're raising cash and they're buying companies and making investments for the first time. It can be very profitable. Also is a little more aggressive because we don't exactly know what we're buying and we're just trusting our general partner to use good judgment to make good investments on our behalf. Then if you drop down to the secondary funds line, now you're buying existing positions from funds that have reached their term. And what that means is that there might be an existing private equity structure in the market and has been in the market for the last nine or 10 years, but because they've made a commitment to return capital to their investors, no later than 12 years from now, they may have some companies left in the portfolio that are just not ready to be uh, in the initial public offering stage um, or may not have a normal you know, one on one buyer in the private markets. So their secondary funds will come in and say, that's a very viable company. It still needs a couple more years to mature, but we're willing to buy that. So now when I'm investing in a secondary fund, instead of being in a blind pool where I don't know what the general partner is gonna buy, now I'm in a position where I can identify what the general partner is investing in. And that's an enormous advantage. And it also illustrates a way to reduce what's that J curve, because we're not gonna own it as long as we will in a primary fund. And then the third on the bottom for co-investments, this is when a private equity company that is in market may have found an opportunity to buy a company, but they just don't have enough cash to invest in the company to buy it for their particular fund. 
So they may come to a firm like a Morgan Stanley, and there are many others, and say, we have this excellent opportunity. We just don't have enough cash to invest and buy the whole company. Would you be interested in partnering with us where maybe we own half and you own half? And there are funds that are structured specifically to do that that are known as co-investments. And so that is another way to mitigate the J curve and give yourself an opportunity to have a little advantage over uh, what you might be hoping for in a primary fund because you're just unsure of really what you're going to get. In the co-investment, we're in a position where we can say yes or no to other well-managed portfolios out there and we can decide if we wanna be their partner in our fund or not. Uh, my own bias, I prefer secondaries and co-investments to that of primary when available. Um, and I really like the idea of co-investment. I think that that gives us an en enormous advantage because we can set terms that might not otherwise be available for the investment. So let's look at three different types of companies on the private equity spectrum. Uh, left side to right, you can see venture capital as a style of private equity. And basically what we're using here is seed or, or startup capital in a private company. These are new, brand new ideas that need our money to launch. Uh, the second, the light blue where it says growth capital is an equity investment in an existing company for growth and expansion. So we've identified good companies that just need a little nudge and a little more liquidity to make it to the next step. And we can create some very positive uh, opportunity sets for our investors uh, with the terms that we can set forth with that uh, investment. And then thirdly, buyout. And these are very mature companies that are expected to experience a liquidity event in the next maybe year to year and a half. And maybe these companies just need a little extra push to make it through the IPO process or need a little extra push to clean up their company's balance sheet a little bit so that they can attract another private buyer. Uh, so buyouts can be very uh, profitable, and it also has generally a shorter time horizon. So again, mitigating that J-curve challenge that we have in this particular space. So let's talk about private real estate. We haven't really spent much time on real estate, and it's an important asset class. And this is why. So when you look at the left side, you can see that the NCREIF property, the one that's got the olive colored uh, oblong shaped circle. You can see what the historical return and 10 year volatility has been in that particular asset class. And that asset class is uh, an investment that's private, that is unlevered, meaning it doesn't have any debt, and you're just investing in private real estate that's not traded on the stock market. If you move over to the next section for the NARIT all equity, this is in the public space. So it's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. It has inherent volatility with the movement of the stock market. The historical performance has been higher, but you can see that the volatility has been four times greater than that of the private investment. So now let's move over to the uh, lime green colored boxes. And let's look at the S&P 500 squares. For the unlevered private real estate, when you look at what the correlation is to the S&P 500, it's actually negative. That's an enormous advantage from a math perspective. When you're trying to assemble a portfolio that truly has a benefit from a correlation perspective, if you can identify an investment it actually goes in a different direction than that of the stock market, we now have substantial diversification. And although there are benefits from a diversification perspective from a public real estate investment trust, if you drop down to the second line under the S&P 500 column where it says 0.73, that means that that investment is gonna move in the same direction of the stock market basically 75% of the time. And so that then can help you identify whether or not as an investor, you want to reach for return and try to capture higher historical returns from a public investment in a real estate investment trust, 
or whether you are trying to reduce the correlation of the real estate investment to your portfolio, where you may want to stay in an unlevered private investment within the real estate space. So let's look at the kinds of properties that typical real estate funds invest in. Uh, in you, know, you can start with office. That office space tends to be a bit more volatile, can be very profitable, but you have to be willing to tolerate the inherent volatility of that asset class. On the other hand, multifamily housing tends to be substantially more defensive, that income is stable, uh, and we don't have to worry so much with economic cycles changing the performance history of that asset class. If the upper right, you can go into retail, that is certainly gonna be in a higher volatility asset class and often generated uh, based on consumer demand for shopping and whether or not we're in a recession or if we're in a strong phase in the economy, that often will Ill, uh, impact whether or not shoppers are inclined to support the companies in a mall, for example. And then industrial, less volatile than office. And so when you're thinking in terms of industrial, very common in today's world, where is Amazon's next warehouse going to be? So that would be an example of an industrial space. So let's talk about the various private real estate investment strategies that you could consider. Uh, three primary, uh, core, where you're looking at a lower risk where you're investing in higher quality cash generating properties. Your value add properties are good properties that might need a facelift. And then opportunistic, very high growth where you find a building that needs a big renovation and might currently have a high vacancy rate that you expect to uh, improve with that uh, renovation. Let's talk about private credit. Private credit is basically non-bank lending where the debt instrument is not traded on the public market. It's also known as direct lending or private lending. And so in this particular slide, let's focus primarily on the, the right side and the key drivers of change in private credit because the majority of private credit is the result of new regulations in the banking industry, um, preventing lending to your many small and mid-sized market companies. And so the demand has increased, so there's a huge market for this. So we have a situation now where banks used to lend money to these businesses. They can't anymore because of the 2008 crisis and the change in regulation. And then if you combine that change in opportunity from the banks to switch it over to institutional and high net worth retail investors, they have an appetite for this space because interest rates have dropped so much that they can't invest in the traditional markets and earn the kind of income that they were used to. So they're willing to exchange liquidity for a higher cash flow. And so that's basically why you're seeing such an interest in this space. The opportunity is there, the need is there from the company, and the appetite for the income is there for the, the lenders. So there's basically three types of private credit, uh, each has a different risk profile. So your direct lending, uh, your, your senior secured, basically the top of the debt list for the company. Uh, you've got structured credit or specialty lending. That's generally when you lend money to a company that's secured by a specific asset. And then you're just stressed investing, very aggressive. You're lending to troubled companies to earn a higher return. And often, because these companies need your money, you can dictate some terms that are very profitable to the investor uh, if that company succeeds. These courses are not designed to sell a product or even sell you on our services. It's designed simply to teach. But a course like this would be incomplete if we didn't discuss the required due diligence process required prior to investment. And so I'm just gonna run you through what we do. Uh, many companies do similar things, I'm sure. I just happen to intimately know what we do at our firm. But it's important that you go through these steps because large opportunity set, a lot of good companies, and also a lot of not so good companies, and you gotta be careful what you're investing in. 
And so manager selection is very, very critical to success. There's a wide disparity of returns in alternatives, just like traditional markets. So manager selection is key. And if you can look on this chart and see on the left side, you have your traditional managers on the left and your alternative managers on the right. The return range in that middle blue line is the median return for that asset class. But you can see how on the alternative side, the range is so much greater than that of the traditional market. Selectivity is key. You have to know who you're lending your money to or investing your money with to make sure that you have confidence that they're going to give you that upper band of return profile. And so let's examine what we're looking for in a manager. Uh, we want a talented, deep investment team. We want consistent, repeatable process from that team. And we want a strong attention to risk management. In the business, that middle column, we're looking for low personnel uh, turnover. We wanna make sure that our general partners are investing their own money in their strategy so they're eating their own cooking. And then from an operations perspective, we wanna make sure that we can examine a representative composite performance list. Uh, that, and basically what you have to be careful about in this space is sometimes these managers will cherry pick their performance and say, oh, we're gonna show you a handful of our performance with our different um, investors and they're picking their best ones as opposed to a complete composite. So we always expect a complete composite. We wanna see uh, reasonable asset levels. We want a solid disaster recovery procedure and we want institutional quality infrastructure. We don't wanna work with hedge funds that are housed out of somebody's basement. So our process for due diligence is a five-step process. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that would wanna be on our platform. So you know, we, we go through this particular process where we start off simply with a due diligence questionnaire, then we go on to an on-site visit. Um, and look on, on the bottom of on-site visits, this is very important. Server room re review. I think that's lost on a lot of investors. If you don't pay attention to the security at the company, now you are only as strong as your weakest link in cybersecurity. So if we're gonna allow our clients' assets to be located with a company that's outside of the, in our case, the Morgan Stanley Greystone construct, we wanna make sure that they have a commitment to cybersecurity that we have for our clients. So we go on site to make sure that they're doing everything within best practices to protect the data that our clients would provide to them as an investor. Then we go into background checks uh, for each one of the investment managers that we're willing to hire. Following that, we do a committee presentation. And then after, if we decide that we're gonna put them on platform after the committee approves, then we do an annual visit with each of our managers uh, as an ongoing monitoring process. And so what, what the numbers are, you know, there are 12,000 products that we analyze that want to get on our platform. We do a review down to 450 where we'll go visit 450 of those 12,000 opportunities, but we'll only hire 50 to 60. So think about just the level of due diligence and the standards that you have to have in order to participate on our platform. So you're going from 12,000 down to 50 or 60. So in our judgment, we've really identified the best of the best investment managers for our clients' capital. Lastly, let's talk about alternative investment portfolio construction. You know, how to identify how much of a portfolio to put in an alternative investment. And keeping in mind, it's not just hedge funds. It's not just private. It's not just real estate. It's a combination of those potential investment strategies that add value in a diversified portfolio for our clients. And so we break it down between liquid alternative investments and illiquid. And generally the breakdown is if you have less than 25 million, you're gonna use primarily liquid investment alternatives. And then if you have more than 25, you probably would be better off and can afford to tie up some of your money for a longer period of time. And you can go into an illiquid strategy. 
And so this is very fresh. This is very fresh thinking from our firm, where if you have less than 25 million, our view is that you could allocate up to 22% of the capital of a diversified portfolio in the alternative investment space. And if you have more than 25 million, you could actually increase it to 26% comfortably. And it's our view that that is the best allocation of capital to provide that risk reward exchange for that particular asset class. Thematically for this year, this is 2020, uh, we do have uh, a bit of a volatile market environment. Uh, we're favoring diversified hedged equity and multi-strategy and distressed investing strategies. We're always going to prefer co-investment and secondary investments because of the economic efficiencies that they provide. Thematically, uh, we are favoring international strategies and specialists as well as healthcare. And then lastly, for our income investors, uh, we're focused on private real estate investment trusts and asset-backed corporate lending strategies, uh, especially in the distressed space because there's that opportunity right now. Those aren't recommendations for you as an investor. That just happens to be thematically where we're spending most of our time mining for opportunities for our clients. I hope you found today's topic to be useful in investing your clients or your companies with a thoughtful delivery in the alternative investment space. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to contact me or contact MICPA to make sure that you get the additional information uh, that you need. Thanks again for your attention today and I hope you found today's time useful. Thank you.